So thank you for all uh, listening today to the Introduction to Injury Prevention webinar. My name is Alison Alari and I am from the Injury Control Council of Western Australia. So at uh, the Injury Control Council, we believe in a life uninterrupted by injury. We are a for-purpose, non-for-profit agency leading the way in preventing injury and supporting recovery in WA. At ICA, we believe injuries and violence don't just, have, don't just occur by chance, but they can be predicted and prevented through a range of coordinated, evidence-informed programs and services. So our aspiration is that all West Australians, children and adults alike, can enjoy a life uninterrupted by injury. So at ICA, there are three core programs. We are a unique agency in the fact that we focus on the prevention as well as the recovery, as well as the recovery when injury does occur. So one of our programs, Stay on Your Feet, aims to reduce falls in four related injuries in older adults living in the community in Western Australia. We have a road trauma support service, which is a free counselling service for anyone who is affected by road trauma in WA. So our clients could include family and friends of people who have died or been seriously injured by road crashes, uh, first responders on the scene such as bystanders or emergency services, and also some clients, uh, people who may have caused the crash themselves. This is a really important service as it prevents ongoing trauma that can be resulted for complicated grief and loss. So the third program is No Injury. So No Injury aims to enhance the capacity of practitioners working in injury prevention such as community development offices uh, to deliver evidence-informed injury prevention activities. So we can do this through providing information and resources, training and also networking opportunities. I believe it is because of our commitment to build the capacity of practitioners like yourselves um, to deliver evidence-informed activities that we are here today. So no injury is underpinned by this philosophy know, learn, connect. So knowing is knowing about different injury types. Uh, learning is learning about injury prevention practice. Uh, we can do this through providing training around the public health approach to injury prevention, um, surveillance, determinants, uh, interventions, implementation and evaluation. Uh, connecting, so uh, connecting with other people and agencies conducting injury prevention around WA. So the pillars of community safety. The three pillars of community safety, injury prevention, crime prevention and emergency response. So safety, well safe and injury can be described as being on a continuum with safe being the optimal and injury being the least optimal. The continuum is similar to the health and disease continuum. So what is injury? So injury usually means physical harm to a person's body caused by intentional or unintentional exchange of energy between people or people and objects. So injury can cover a wide range of areas such as burns and scalds, drowning, falls, poisoning, road trauma, suicide and self-harm or violence. So injuries can often be thought of as accidents. However, this is inaccurate as it suggests a lack of control over the event. While well, injuries can result from events that are unpredictable, well, in, uh, injuries can result from events that are predictable and preventable. Diseases and injury are also differentiated, as generally disease happens over a longer period of time, whereas injury generally has an immediate impact on the individual. So what is safety? Safety is a state in which hazards and conditions leading to physical, psychological, or material harm are controlled in order to preserve the health and well-being of individuals and the community. In addition to the absence of intentional or unintentional injuries, safety must also lead to a perception of being sheltered from danger. So there are two dimensions of a safe state, objective and subjective safety. So objective safety is or can be assessed by measuring the number of injuries or behavioural and environmental factual parameters such as traffic related deaths recorded in a community or the proportion of drivers reported being under the influence of alcohol. And subjective safety is the feeling of being out of danger or the safety of the population. 
So to gather data to assess safety, subjectively discussion groups, um, surveys and forums are often conducted. Intentional versus unintentional injury. So it can be convenient to classify injuries according to their cause, which is why injuries are usually subdivided by the casual mechanism or how they occur, which can be intentional or unintentional. The most commonly used subcategories for unintentional injuries are falls, burns, drownings, poisonings, burns and scalds. Um, traffic accidents are also commonly used in this category. So intentional injuries are those that result from a person's purposeful action, whether directed at themselves or at others. Uh, for example, terms used include intentional self-harm, interpersonal violence and suicide. So the determinants of injury. Determinants are factors that both raise and lower the risk of injury um, occurring. So those factors can have a positive influence, um, are known as protective factors, and those that have a negative influence are known as risk factors. Determinants combine to influence the health and safety of individuals and communities. Therefore, various determinants of injury at multiple levels may be considered to effectively target interventions. So social determinants. Um, these are the conditions in which people are born, work, live and age, and the wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of daily life. These forces and systems include economic policies, development agendas, social norms, social policies and political systems, including economical, cultural, education and political determinants. The environmental determinants are closely linked with social determinants of health and they tend to influence one another. So these can include uh, what surrounds us, so where people live, work and play. So factors including your workplace, school, friends and family. And then also we have the behavioural determinants. So those, it is those that are linked to actions that people take every day that increase the risk of an injury called risk behaviours or the decreased risk of injury called the health protecting behaviours of a person. These can include knowledge, attitudes and beliefs, etc. So understanding the magnitude of injury. So mortality and hospitalisation data can provide a valuable insight into the severity of injury. However, they only make up a proportion of injuries as some injuries do not result in death or hospitalisation. So this is why the injury pyramid is a good tool to use to illustrate the full scope of injury. The top of the pyramid includes the injuries that are easiest and most accurate to measure before progressing down to those that are often unreported and therefore the most difficult to measure. Despite the injuries at the bottom of the pyramid not requiring treatment within the healthcare system, their volume does not have an impact. Different injuries have different levels of severity and therefore the ratio between the levels of the pyramid is impacted by the type of injury. When looking into what is affected by injury, the data can be categorised by demography, so your age, gender, aboriginality, etc., the setting, the geographical location or environmental setting and time. So looking at the burden of injury worldwide, the burden of injury is how we compare the relative impact of different injuries and populations by quantifying the health loss that remains after treatment, rehabilitation, or prevention efforts by the healthcare system and society. So this involves mortality and morbidity data. Mortality being the number of deaths and morbidity being the number of injuries per population. So globally, globally injury is the leading cause of death and disability resulting in 10% of global mortality. So there are 5 million deaths per year as a result of injury, 3.3 million males and 1.7 million females. Um, in 2010, the injury mortality rate was 78 per 100,000 compared with HIV at 33 per 100,000 and malaria at 12 per, at 12 per 100,000, which really puts it into perspective. So now looking at the injury burden in Australia. So injury is responsible for a large number of hospitalisations in Australia, thus making it a chronic health issue. Other long-term consequences include pressure on the health services, mental health issues and the associated economic, social and healthcare costs. So between 2011 and 2012, 
just over 454,000 people were injured severely enough to be admitted to hospital. One, of, one in four of these hospitalisations were people over the age of 65. Rates of hospitalisation increased with distance from a major city and the hospitalisation data also indicate that Indigenous Australians are twice as likely to be admitted to hospital for an injury between 2011 and 2012. This over-representation is influenced by the high number or high proportion of Indigenous people living in remote regions in Australia. So injury was recorded as a cause of over 10,000 deaths in 2009 and 2010 in Australia. So looking at the burden of injury in WA, the burden of injury in WA, um, so between 2007 and 2011, injury was the fourth highest cause of death in WA. It was also the fourth highest cause of uh, hospitalisation in WA between 2008 and 2012. So this table breaks down the total deaths, hospitalisations and yearly cost of hospitalisation for seven injury areas. As you can see, suicide and self-harm had the highest number of deaths between 2007 and 2011 at just over 1,400 and falls accounted for the highest number of hospitalisations and as a flow on from these hospitalisations had the highest approximated cost of hospitalisation. The impact that injury has on all West Australia reinforces the importance of focusing on the preventable and predictable nature of injury and the need to make injury a priority. Also, the wide range of health areas within injury contributes to the need for an integrated approach to injury prevention by a range of health sectors. Injury is a complex public health issue which is related to other social issues such as homelessness. So injury is a national health priority area. So injury prevention was identified as a national priority area in 1986. This was due to its burden it places on the healthcare system the fact that it is largely preventable and also that it has a major impact on the health of all Australians. So between 2012 and 2016, uh, the priorities for injury prevention in WA were identified as road crashes and road trauma, preventing falls in older people, uh, children or childhood injuries, improving water safety and reducing interpersonal violence. So the public health approach to injury prevention. So a common method to preventing injuries is the public health approach to injury prevention, which consists of five stages. Surveillance, to work out what the issue is. Determinants, to work out what might be causing or influencing the issue. Interventions, to develop interventions to address the issue. Implementation, to implement the intervention. And evaluation to evaluate the intervention to work out how addressed, to work out how it was addressed or influenced. This framework includes implementation and evaluation together as one stage. However, at new injury, we segregate our evaluation as it is a significant part of the framework and as such, we felt it required a separate section. However, that being said, in the planning of the intervention, you will need to consider how the project will be evaluated. Although the approach looks like a linear process, it is an integrated process. So let's look a bit more closely at surveillance. Surveillance is the, fir the first stage uh, is surveillance and is a key step in injury prevention planning process. This stage involves the collection, analysis, interpretation of information in order to understand the context, find the priority injury issue and describe the extent to which the selected injury is a problem. So the second stage, determinants. In this stage, scientific research methods are used to identify which factors increase the risk of injury and also which factors reduce the risk of injury. So risk factors for injury prevention can be separated into categories. So they can be factors relating to the person, such as their age, gender, socioeconomic status, um, alcohol and drug consumption or attitudes. They may be uh, factors relating to transport, such as road car worthiness, uh, factors relating to the physical environment, such as roads, pavements, safety in homes and perceived safety, 
and also the social environment. So acceptance of violence, speeding, stress and uh, social norms. So the third stage is interventions and involves assessing what can be done about the issue. So an intervention is a combination of activities designed to change behavioural, environmental and or social determinants to improve the health status of individuals or populations. The fourth stage is implementation. So information is collected in the planning stages um, and are now brought together to implement an evidence-informed intervention. There may be many individuals and organisations involved in implementing an intervention as an injury risk often needs to be addressed by multi-component interventions. And the final stage, the fifth stage, is evaluation and involves assessing and making judgments about whether the intervention implemented in stage four made an impact on preventing injuries in the community. So the ease of injury prevention. The ease of injury prevention are environmental engineering, um, it can often be referred to as either or, uh, enforcement and education. So environmental or engineer, or engineering um, involves modifying the design of products in the environment to ensure that they are safe for people to live and use every day. Um, it can also be considered a passive inter intervention as individuals are not required to undertake any action to be protected. And also these strategies are found to be more effective for injury prevention than other active measures. So the enforcement uh, refers to legislation and policies. So enforcing legislation and policy, policies and the penalties associated with not following these legislation or policies influence the actions of individuals to reduce risk and injury. And the third E, education. So this informs people individually or on a mass scale. Uh, it can increase knowledge, alter their attitudes and encourage behaviour change. Education methods alone will not necessarily result in behaviour change but it should be considered an active intervention which requires an individual to take action each time um, they undertake a safety, me safety measure. So success depends on the beliefs, efforts and actions of those that, that the education is targeting. Some organisations have expanded the list of E's, um, adding evaluation, economic incentives and empowerment. So here is a list of some of the people, uh, the agencies working in injury prevention in WA. We have Royal Life Saving WA, KidSafe WA, the Poisons Information Centre, Roadwise WA and WorkSafe WA. So thank you for listening in today. Uh, if you have any questions uh, about uh, injury or how you can get involved in injury prevention, uh, please contact us at No Injury and we will get back to you. Thank you.